I am tired of all my toys, said the little prince. And besides, I've broken the trunk of my biggest wooden elephant. Has your royal highness thought of... Yes, I have, said the prince crossly, without waiting for the sentence to be finished. But you didn't know what I was going to say, objected the prince's tutor. Oh, yes, I did, said the prince, who was looking out of the palace windows. Well, what was it? asked the tutor. You were going to say, have you thought of studying your lessons for tomorrow? That's your idea of cheerful amusement, but it isn't mine. The prince's tutor was silent. What could he say? The prince had guessed exactly what the tutor would have asked, except for the interruption. So the tutor said no more, but began to whistle a tune. I wish you wouldn't do that, said the prince. It makes me nervous. I hate that tune, and I hate whistling. But you whistle sometimes, said the tutor. Not when I'm nervous, said the prince's reply. But what shall I do to amuse myself? Take a book, was the tutor's suggestion. What book? Oh, I don't know, any good book. But I'm tired of all the books I've read, and I don't want to begin a new one. Besides, I don't feel like reading. I'm too nervous. Nervous, exclaimed the tutor. The idea of a little boy's being nervous. You ought not have any nerves. Somebody's been talking nonsense to you. That's so, said the prince. Well, who is it? asked the tutor. It's you, was the prince's reply. In short, the little fellow was decidedly out of humor, and felt like quarreling with the tutor simply because he was the nearest person. If it had been the king, he would have been snappish to the king. If it had been the queen, he would have whined at her. But as it was the tutor, a pale and thin young man with a high forehead, light straw-colored eyebrows, and spectacles, why, the prince was doing his best to make him angry. The tutor was used to this, and he did not let the prince bother him. When the prince became too bad-tempered, the tutor would go to one of the bookcases and take down a big fat volume entitled The History of Transcaucasian Enterprises Under the Auspices of the Committee on Extraterrestrial Immigration. Then he would bury his nose so deeply in between the pages that he couldn't hear a word the prince was saying. It was a great rest for the prince's tutor's mind. This is what he did now and was lost to the world. Count Brickabrack, said the prince, for that was his tutor's name. Hem, hem, was the only reply. So the prince had to leave Count Brickabrack to his interesting book. But the prince was bound to find some amusement. He began to look around his playroom at the various things hung on the walls. Suddenly, his eye brightened as he saw his favorite fishing pole hung upon the two golden hooks. He went across the room, pushed a rosewood table against the wall, and climbed upon it, scratching quite a number of marks on the polished top. He took down the pole, and then looked around for something for which to bait the hook. He saw the broken elephant lying near his Noah's Ark, for though this happened a long time ago, it was not before the flood, and the prince had Noah's Ark just like other little boys. He was going to fish in the moat that surrounded the palace walls, and he decided to use the wooden elephant for bait. It was some trouble to get the little elephant on the hook, but at length he succeeded in putting the hook through one of the ears, which were made of felt, and then, going to the window, he flung out the end of the line and unreeled it until it reached the surface of the water far below. There, it bobbed up and down in the sunshine while the prince waited for a bite. He did not have to wait long, Suddenly, there was a commotion in the water. Something came rushing up from the depths and swallowed the wooden elephant. At once, the line began to run out from the reel, and the prince, capering about, shouted, I've caught a fish! I've caught a fish! And he pulls like a big one! But Count bric a -brac paid no attention, for he was so deeply interested in his book. Then the prince began to haul in the line. The fish, or whatever was at the end of the line, pulled very hard. But the prince was a strong youngster and gradually drew in his catch. When it came to the top of the water, he suddenly saw that he had caught a young dragon, and a lively young creature it was, 
bright green with scarlet mouth, purple ears, and a lovely tail, all the colors of the rainbow. It was the first dragon the prince had ever seen. But he knew what it was because he had seen pictures of dragons in his favorite book of fairy tales. You might think that he would have cried out, but he was afraid that Count Bricabrac would not let him keep the little dragon, so he said nothing, but hauled it in as quick as he could. When the dragon felt itself coming out of the water, and then being dragged up the wall of the palace, it began to yowl. Count Bricabrac heard the noise, and for a moment looked up from his reading. Come, come, he exclaimed. You mustn't cry like that, a big boy like you. But the dragon didn't stop his noise. He was sorry that he had not left the wooden elephant alone, and made up his mind then and there never to touch elephant meat again. But this good resolution came too late, for the prince hauled the little captive in through the window, threw him flapping on the floor, and then dropping the pole, picked up the dragon, put him into his Noah's Ark, shut down the lid, and fastened it with the hook. Of course, the dragon kept up his howling all the time, and even Count Bricabrac noticed it. "'What is all this noise?' he asked, frowning severely. "'This whining must be stopped.' The prince was afraid his tutor would find out about the dragon, so he at once seated himself at his piano and began to practice his scales as loud and as fast as he could. This had two good effects. It drowned the noise of the dragon's wails, and it drove the tutor out of the room without his being able to take offense for of course he could not object to the prince's practicing without getting into trouble with the countess Metronomsky, who taught him music. So Count Bricabrac fled, slamming the door after him, and the prince was left alone with his dragon. After a few minutes, the prince shut the piano and opened the Noah's Ark. At once the dragon crawled out and began to jump about the floor. The little dragon was about as big as a half-grown puppy and seemed more frightened than fierce. Soon the prince noticed that the hook was sticking in the dragon's lower jaw and catching the scared creature, removed it. Then the dragon quieted down and soon allowed the prince to pat its head and showed its pleasure by purring like a big cat while its fiery little eyes glowed softly. After the hook was out, the dragon seemed very quiet, and before long began to blink its little eyes as if drowsy. This suited the prince exactly, for it was nearly supper time, and he was hungry. So he made up a cozy little nest for the dragon in the darkest corner of his playroom closet, using for the bedding several velvet doublets and cloaks of which the prince owned more than any sensible youngster could wear. The dragon coiled itself up like a crawler, and was soon fast asleep and snoring as comfortably as if it were at home, whereupon the prince went to supper as quietly as if he caught dragons every day in the week, and really there would be no story to tell if the little dragon had happened to be an orphan. But it had a strong, fierce mother, a lively, inquisitive father, several well-grown brothers and sisters, to say nothing of other relatives from cousins to granduncles, and they were all looking for the pretty little thing. The dragon had gone out for a quiet afternoon soaring when it had been chased by an eagle, had lost its way, and after flying till it was tired, had dropped into the moat of the palace. How the big dragons discovered where the little dragon was is not quite certain. Possibly they were told by a bothering old busybody of a bat that was blundering about just as the prince had hauled in the line. Certainly they found it out, for the prince's supper was not quite over when there came a sound of a great commotion outside of the palace. Flapping and clapping of wings, scraping of claws, bellowing, yowling, howling, as if a thousand gentle nurses were washing a thousand cross boys all at once. The confusion was terrible. The guards who had been stationed on the towers and walls came running in to say that it was raining dragons and every dragon was breathing out fire and lashing his tail. All the doors and windows were closed, and all the people in the palace wished they had always been good. The king, who had been busy playing checkers with the queen, did not for some time get a clear idea of what was going on. He was rather deaf, and at first thought the people were talking about wagons, and gave orders for them to put them into the stable. 
Then he thought it was flagons and said, Oh, well then put them into the cellar. This is while they were all talking at once. But when it was a little quieter and the queen said distinctly, Not wagons or flagons, dear, but dragons. They say it's raining dragons. He pretty nearly understood, for he asked fiercely, Who says we are raining dragons? Then the trouble was explained to him, and he was led to the window to see the great winged creatures dashing around and around. He said, Dear me, how interesting. Let me see, is there anybody in the palace who can talk dragon talk? Then all the courtiers and pages scampered upstairs and downstairs, repeating the king's question. When at last they had come to the room where the prince and his tutor were at supper, Count Bricabrac said modestly that there was in the royal library a book about dragons, and that in the end there was a list of dragon words with a translation. He believed that by using this to aid him he could speak a little dragon talk, and what did the king want? Thereupon the pages grabbed him and ran him through the halls, up the stairs, bang into the presence of the king. Count Bricabrac thinks he may make out the dragon talk, your majesty, they all bowed. Clearly enough, the deaf king understood. Is this true? he asked. Yes, sire, said the tutor, making a low bow. By aid of a small book that is in the royal library. Well, just step up to the door and see what is the meaning of this visit, said the king, ordering a page to fetch the book at once. If you don't mind, your majesty, may I speak to them through the window, shouted Count Bricabrac in the king's ear. Certainly, certainly, the king agreed. Only find out what they want, and if possible, let them have it. We can't have the air full of dragons all the time. It doesn't seem healthy or quite safe. They might... At this moment there came a bang on the window's shutter, and then a scraping. Count Bricabrac sprang to the shutter and threw it open, while everyone else in the room sidled away toward the opposite wall. As soon as the shutter was open, a dragon's head and long neck was thrust into the room. Count Bricabrac thereupon turned over the pages of the handbook and soon began to address the dragon. <laughs> was his first remark. <laughs> said the dragon, smiling. It is useless to put down more of the conversation. The bright reader will already have seen that the dragon talk is only a kind of algebra. And who wants more algebra that comes naturally? The Count had to make his sentences up slowly, and it took a long time to find out the dragon's replies. But they understood each other in a way, and before very long Count Bricabrac was able to report to the King the gist of the conversation. The dragons tell me, said the Count, that they have good reason to think that someone has captured a baby dragon and has shut it up somewhere about the palace. Nonsense, exclaimed the king. It is impossible. Which shows that even kings are now and then mistaken. At this moment the prince, having finished his supper, entered the room. He looked rather uneasy, for he had guessed what was the trouble, and had not made up his mind what to do. So he remained silent, waiting to see what would happen. I fear, said Count Bricabrac, that there is no mistake. They are very keen scent, and they tell me that if you will admit a single dragon to the castle, it will be easy to find the missing youngster. What do you advise? the king remarked after a pause. I think, your serene highness, that there can be no objection to admitting a single dragon if it will promise not to breathe fire on furniture or scratch up the polished floors. But won't the dragon eat us? exclaimed old Duchess Darning Needle. No danger, said Count Bricabac without reflection. Dragons only care for the young and tender maidens. Now wasn't that a foolish speech? Of course it made the Duchess furious. And while she had never been fond of him, she disliked Count Bricabrac more than ever afterward, and that brought him trouble. So it was decided to let one dragon enter the castle and make a careful search for the missing member of their family. The front gate was cautiously opened, and a great yellow dragon in spectacles. Maybe you didn't know they wore spectacles, but this one did. He had stolen them from an optician's shop. Was allowed to crawl in. 
He was the father dragon, and at once began sniffing about to catch the scent, and soon caught it, for he immediately began to climb the winding stair that led to the prince's playroom. The whole court followed, but were exceedingly careful to keep clear of the monster's tail, the end of which was very sharp and went whisking about like a broken trolley wire. Straight to the prince's playroom went the big dragon, and when he reached the room, he went right to the door of the closet. Then the door was opened by Count Bricabrac, and in a moment more, the baby dragon was clasped in his father's arms. It was a touching scene, and many of the court were moved to tears. Soon afterward, the father dragon departed with his recovered darling, and when he reappeared at the palace gate, the dragons burst into a storm of cheering that sounded like the steam whistles that blow on the night before New Year's Day. Then, like a swarm of great birds, the whole flock of dragons rose into the air until they looked no bigger than crows, and away they flew over hill, dale, valley, and plain, until they were once more amid their mountainous peaks and crags. Then, settling into a nice flat rocky place, before a big cavern where they lived, they all sang their natural song, which runs thus. Dry desert is a view, region where plants are few, of you we howl. Come all ye crawly things, proud of sharp crawls and stings, wave all your flapping wings, let dragons yowl. This and other verses they sang with great enthusiasm, and then dispersed about their regular nightly wrongdoing. Meanwhile, nothing particular was done at the palace, for the simple reason that it was bedtime, and everyone was so tired with the excitement about the dragons that all were very glad to get into their nice white nightgowns and cuddle down until the morning. That is, all but one. There was one who did not sleep. The Duchess Dawning Needle was very angry at what Count Bricabrac had said about her being in no danger because she was not young and tender. She didn't like Count Bricabrac anyway, as has been said, because he has succeeded her as the prince's teacher and had not liked the way she taught the prince his fractions. Altogether, as she thought it over, she became hopping mad, so mad she could not sleep. At length, she took a quill pen, and she wrote a little letter to an old witch of her acquaintance, who lived in a cave not far from the palace grounds. In this note, she told a horrid story. She said that it was Bric-a-Brac who had stolen the young dragon, and she told the witch to let the dragons know all about it. Of course, the witch did not know the note was not true. So, being able to speak the dragon language a little, she went to the head dragon of them all, the father of the little dragon, and told him that Count Bricabrac had captured the little one and that he ought to be punished for it. The old dragon thought this reasonable, and without telling any of the others what he meant to do, he quietly flew over to the palace, and hiding himself in the top of one of the tallest trees, awaited his chance to carry off the prince's tutor. He had not long to wait, for it was Bricabrac's custom to walk in the palace gardens every afternoon before supper, reading some improving book. When the count came near to the tree, the father dragon swooped down like a hawk and bore Bricabrac aloft. No one saw this capture except the wicked duchess, who was on the watch because she thought something of the sort might happen. When he felt himself lifted into the air, Count Bricabrac was quite startled and exclaimed, "'Goodness! This is really most unexpected and so sudden!' Then the Duchess leaned out of her tower window as the Count was carried by, and waved her lace handkerchief, said in a sneering and mocking tone, "'Oh, never mind, Count! Dragons only eat the young and tender!' Now wasn't that mean of her? But at last... The Count knew, by her remark, who was to blame for his misfortune. He did not forget the Duchess's spitefulness. He was very clever, and he understood at once what the old woman had done. But he could not talk dragon language at all without the book in the library, 
and he wasn't reading that one. So he had to let himself be carried off. And to show you how cool and collected he was, he went on reading his book all the time Father Dragon was flying through the air and never lost his place either. After Bric-a-Brac's disappearance, the Duchess made up her mind to go and tell the King that the tutor had been carried off by a dragon, for she thought that if she was the first to give the alarm, no one would suspect that she was to blame. So the Duchess Darning Needle put all her false curls into the greatest disorder, and pretending great grief, rushed into the palace hall, and cried out as, as if in deepest distress, Oh me! Oh my! That charming and sweet Count Bric-a-Brac! Oh, oh, oh! What shall we do? Oh, oh! Of course, everybody came clustering about to know what terrible thing had happened. But she only caterwauled the louder, and pulled at her curls until she tore some out, which, as they were false, didn't hurt her at all. She made as much noise as two pigs under a gate, and nobody could get a word out of her until the king came in. But he wouldn't stand for her nonsense, not for a minute. He told her to hush, and then shook her till her teeth rattled. This quieted her, and then the king made her tell what had happened, and be quick about it, too. Oh, exclaimed the duchess, it's the big dragon that was here on Friday, and he has carried off his little royal highness's tutor, the noble Count Bric-a-Brac. And to think he should become food for the horrid dragons up there in the mountains, isn't it terrible? The king was shocked, of course. So would any man be, on hearing that his son's only tutor had been carried away by the chief of a whole race of dragons. But though naturally a little uneasy, the king gave proper orders at once. He directed that a handsome reward should be offered for the Count's return uninjured, and at the same time summoned all his wisest counselors to hold a grand meeting to devise diverse and sundry ways and means for taking such measures as would accomplish something toward the Count's release. What else could any ruler do? But there was one member of the court who decided that there was something else to be done. The little prince was not at all thoughtless, only naughty. He felt that if anyone was to blame for the fate of Count bric brac it was himself. It was he who had fished for the little dragon with the toy elephant, and now that his tutor was paying the penalty, the prince could not rest. Of course, he should have gone to his father just as George Washington did in the cherry tree case, but George had not happened at that early date, and so how could the prince know what to do? What he did was to pack a few clothes into a satchel, help himself to some chocolate cake and macaroons out of the royal pantry, and set off for the home of the dragons. No doubt this was very imprudent, but it was brave, and not many small boys of his age would have done it. Luckily, no one saw him climb over the palace gate and except for slightly tearing his silk hose, all went well. It was a long walk up the mountains, but the prince climbed on behind a wagon for part of the way, and he reached the dragonland before nightfall. Here he met a sentinel, a rather stylish young dragon, who asked him his business. The prince replied politely, but as neither could speak the other's language, the remarks did not fit very well. The conversation was something like this. "'What do you want here?' asked the dragon in his language. "'From the king's palace. I'm the prince,' was the reply in the prince's language. "'I don't understand. Can't you speak dragon language?' "'To rescue Count bric brac said the prince firmly. "'What is a little boy like you?' doing out all alone, was the dragon's next question. I alone am to blame, said the prince, for I caught the little dragon. I came to surrender myself. I can't understand a word you say, said the dragon. Count bric brac had nothing to do with it, the prince went on. Now this was the second time bric brac's name had been said, and the dragon had heard it before. Bric-a-brac, though he had been a prisoner but a few hours, 
was already learning the language a little, and had told the dragons his name. The sentinel, therefore, decided that the boy's visit had something to do with the captive, and led the way up the rocky road. But seeing the prince was tired, he kindly stooped down and made signs for the little fellow to climb upon his back. This the brave prince did, and a few moments of rapid flight brought them to the dragon's settlement. Here the prince was delighted to find his tutor seated beside the chief dragon, trying to teach the alphabet out of the one book he had carried away. The two friends greeted each other warmly, and after a few moments the prince explained why he had came. "'I cannot tell a lie, Count bric he said. "'I did it with my little wooden elephant. You must go free.' "'My dear boy,' exclaimed the tutor, "'I'd rather you had caught a hundred young dragons than to have told a falsehood, but I cannot allow you to take my place.' "'But I must,' said the prince. "'Let me tell the dragons at once that you are innocent.' "'You can't do it,' objected the tutor. "'And I can't either, for I haven't the handbook. "'We don't know how to speak the language. "'You will have to wait until I taught the dragons to speak ours.' "'That might take some time,' the prince remarked. "'It may,' Count bric admitted. For so far, the old dragon has learned only four letters of the alphabet. A, C, D, B, the dragon remarked proudly as he heard the word alphabet. Very nearly correct, said the tutor. A, B, C, D, we say. A, B, C, D, the dragon repeated with great cleverness. Exactly, Count bric -a agreed, patting the big dragon on the head, for he was proud of his pupil. Then he went on to the prince. You see, we are very good friends. The dragons had an idea of eating me at first, but provisions are plenty just now, and I got them interested in learning. I believe we are safe for the present. Sit down and let me finish the lesson. So the prince sat down and listened to the Count's efforts to teach the big dragon to read. After the lesson was over, Count bric -a explained by signs that the prince and he were good friends and the dragons good-naturedly left them together. The prince brought out his chocolate cake and he and his tutor ate their supper, saving the macaroons for breakfast, afterwards retiring to a cleft in the rocks where Count bric -a was lodged. Meanwhile, there was a great to-do at the palace the prince's absence was discovered, and everybody thought the dragons had carried him away. The king and his counselors held another meeting and decided to offer more rewards. The reward for the prince was enormous, and when the Duchess Darning Needle had read the king's proclamation, she decided to try to win the great prize for herself. Putting on a thick black veil and wrapping herself in a long cloak, she stole out one dark night and went to talk the matter over with her friend, the witch. This queer old woman was in her cave frying donuts, and she was not well pleased to see a visitor being very greedy and wanting all the three dozen donuts for herself. As for the Duchess, she was especially fond of donuts, and the smell of them made her mouth water so she could hardly speak plainly. "'Good evening, Mother Black.' said the duchess very politely. You seem to be busy cooking something. Yes, I am, said the old witch. Only a bit of something for my supper. Nothing very nice, nothing very nice. It smells like doughnuts, said the duchess with a grin. She meant for a sweet smile. You seem to make very nice ones. Good enough for a toothless old thing like me, said the witch. "'I should like to taste one,' said the Duchess eagerly. "'But it is witch food,' said Mother Black, "'and I'm afraid you wouldn't like it. "'Besides, I only have a few.' The Duchess knew better, for there were at least two dozen already cooling in the witch's table. So she rose and walked toward the delicious brown rings. This made the old witch frantic, and waving her crutch in the air, she warned the Duchess away from her dainties. "'Stand back!' she cried. Don't touch them. They're poisoned. 
poisoned, said the Duchess, but you said they were for your supper. I think you are mistaken, said Mother Black shortly. The Duchess, however, was not deceived, though she decided to let the doughnuts alone, for she wished to keep the witch in good humor. She therefore told all about the big reward offered by the king for the rescue of the prince and his tutor, proposing that she and the witch should win it for themselves. The old witch eagerly agreed, and they began to make plans. None seemed good until the duchess announced that she had a bright idea. "'Let us send the dragons the poison doughnuts!' she exclaimed. "'And then, when they are all dead, the prince and Count bric a can be rescued without danger!' "'But,' the witch objected, "'these doughnuts won't poison dragons. They are not that kind.' And besides, you don't want to poison the prince and the count, do you? No, the duchess admitted with a grin. At least not the prince. Perhaps you can put something in a new batch of doughnuts to make them all sleep. And while they're all sleeping, we can carry off their captives. How would that do? There seems no objection to that. Excellent, cried the witch. I will make some of the sort of doughnuts dragons all love and douse them with the juice of an herb that will make them sleep. And there you are. Then we can divide the reward, can we not, dear Duchess? Certainly we can, the Duchess answered. And now, do you think all the doughnuts are poisoned? They seem so nicely browned. There are perhaps two or three that won't hurt you, I'm sure, the witch replied, being now in better humor and soon the two wicked old creatures sat down to a nice dish of crisp doughnuts that were much too good for them, and plotted to secure the big reward. It took several days, it may be a week or more, for Mother Black to prepare the great batch of dosed doughnuts, and during those days Count bric a -brac and the Prince worked hard in teaching the dragons their language, so hard that by the time the doughnuts were all done and dosed, the dragons, or at least a few of them, could talk a little with their captives. But these days of schooling kept the dragons so busy that they had not much time for hunting, and food ran short. In all those days they caught only two elephants, four tigers, and one old camel, and that was very little among so many. Being hungry, the ruder dragons began to look eagerly at the two captives, who had grown plump because of their healthful life in the open air. If you had been a dragon, they would have looked as appetizing to you as two nice round chocolate creams. Of course, the other educated dragons, who had been part way through the primer, had too much respect for their teacher to think of him as food. But the others grumbled, saying learning was well enough in its way when one had plenty to eat. But what good were reading, writing, and arithmetic to a dragon when he was starving? Just as things were looking rather dangerous for the two captives, there arrived a dozen boxes of delicious and delectable doughnuts, addressed to the Honorable Dragons of Dragonville, from a sincere friend who prefers to remain unknown. When the box was opened, the dragons began to sing, saying it was a dainty gift fit to please a king, for the doughnuts were a lovely sealskin brown and done just as dragons like their doughnuts done. The famished dragons begged that the dainties might be at once distributed, but just then Count bric a -brac rushed amid the throng. He had guessed at once that there was something wrong, and desired to warn his friends. Of course, he had to speak in primer language, so his speech went something like this. The dragon must not eat the doughnut. The doughnut will make the dragon sick. It is not a friend who sent the box. A bad one sent the box. It is not a wise dragon who eats the bad doughnut. Shut the box and do not eat the doughnut. Though his manner was earnest, he made little impression, and all insisted upon eating the dosed doughnuts except the big dragon, who loved his teacher, and pretty soon it was evident something was wrong. 
One by one, all who had eaten the fateful donuts fell fast asleep, the greediest first. And by evening, all were asleep and snoring like distant thunderstorms, excepting the old father dragon, Count bric brac and the little prince. The three held a hasty consultation, and by the Count's advice, they pretended to be asleep too. And about midnight, all was very still but the snoring chorus. Then there stole into Dragonland the Duchess Darning Needle and the old witch, driving a donkey cart in which they meant to carry home the captives whom they expected to find sleeping. But when they entered the cave where lay Father Dragon and the two captives, imagine the surprise and disgust of these wicked old creatures to see Father Dragon rise in wrath with fiery eyes and bristling tail, while Count bric brac and the Prince also sprang up to confront the Duchess and the Witch. "'Disgraceful doses of donuts!' exclaimed the Count. "'Now you will receive the reward of your crimes. Fall upon your knees and repent, for by consent of Father Dragon, a true and gentle friend and a bright scholar, we depart at once for the palace uninjured. You will remain as his prisoners.' And though your age and toughness may save your lives, you will probably never be permitted to leave this land, but will pass the rest of your days in frying harmless, undosed donuts for the whole dragon nation, who have almost resolved to give up eating all animal food. It is a just punishment, and I hope it will be borne with such patience as you may have. Then, bidding Father Dragon farewell, he and the prince departed. What was the fate of the two wicked plotters cannot be told with any certainty, for nothing more was ever heard of them. It may be in spite of their resolution and of the new donuts, the dragons ate them both up, but whatever happened to them, they richly deserved it. As for Count bric brac and his little pupil, they had a pleasant little walk down the mountain through beautiful views that were not noticed by the tutor because he read his book all the way. They were received with joy at the palace, and the large reward was paid to them because they had found themselves. The king gave a splendid banquet in honor of the return, and the queen let the prince sit up all through the dessert. So the prince's fishing in the moat ended quite happily for him. But his visit to the dragons had an excellent effect for seeing how the oldest dragon studied his primer taught the prince to value Count bric brac services. And he became a very good scholar indeed, getting marks of from ninety to a hundred nearly every day. Even that was not all, for several years afterward it happened that a most beautiful princess was carried off by a rather bold young dragon, and the princess's father offered half his kingdom and the hand of his daughter in marriage to any brave young prince who could bring her safely back. Count bric brac who was still with his royal master, advised the young prince to attempt the feat, and offered to accompany him in the perilous adventure, thinking his knowledge of dragon talk might be useful. When they had made their way to the dragon's cave, the dragon came out with a terrifying roar, crying, which means, if you don't get away from her, you'll be sorry. But Count bric brac replied very politely in dragon language, and after a few minutes' conversation it came out that this was the very same dragon that Prince had fished for so long ago. And then everything was soon arranged. The princess was politely dismissed with an apology, and rode home behind the prince on his spirited black charger, to the delight of the whole kingdom who were amazed and overcome by the beauty and valor of her rescuer, as well as by his modesty. And then, why then, of course, they were married in the great cathedral, and the bells rang, the cannons roared, all the schools were closed for a week, there were fireworks every night, all the theaters were free, people could walk on the grass in the parks, and there were parades with brass bands in all the principal streets. And among the beautiful wedding presents, one of the most attractive was a large golden vase 
full of the most delicious donuts. And on the vase was an inscription showing that it was from the dragons of Dragonville with their best wishes for the happiness of their royal highnesses, the prince and the princess. The vase was much admired, and the donuts were highly appreciated as long as they lasted. After which, the young prince and his beautiful bride lived happily until they came into the throne, and then they were beloved by their subjects during a reign that lasted, oh, ever so long.